Let me go ahead and get started. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. That's great. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and hit the arrow and move on to the next slide. Do, 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 do. Advance slide. Okay. There's a great book on the geology of North Carolina by Kevin, uh, Kevin Stewart. He's a professor of geology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He wrote the first draft of the book and uh, with the assistance of Mary Russell Robertson, uh, it was an excellent, it became an excellent guide. Uh, Mary is an excellent writer and uh, helped Kevin greatly in making an excellent book on the geology of the Carolinas. It covers everything from Chimney Rock up in North Carolina and all the way down to Charleston and the earthquake in 1886. So it's a real good book and stuff like that. I recommend it highly. Yes, I even have a copy of it with me because a lot of what I'm talking about tonight is actually from that document. Now, in 1823, North Carolina General Assembly established a geological survey. This was the first state survey in the country. The first statewide geologic map was finished in November of 1825 by Professor Dennison Olmsted, a professor of chemistry and mineralogy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Now, the line drawing you see there is basically a simplified version of what the map was actually done. The map itself was about 14 inches in, uh, in, uh, uh, in distance from one end to the other end of the state. And at that time, uh, you see the wiggles on the mountains of North Carolina. They hadn't actually decided where the North Carolina and Tennessee line was actually gonna be. And uh, that didn't get decided until a little bit later but you really get a chance to see the major geological features that even back in Olmsted's time were still dead on in comparison to the Tay's geologic maps. 45% of the state of North Carolina is the coastal plain. And most of the people at the time were planting crops on it, cotton, tobacco and such on that land in order to make money. There were also places where uh, trees were used, for example, the pine trees and such to make naval stores, tar, pitch, and stuff like that. They had the thing that was kind of strange in Raleigh and Wake County. It's called the plumbago of Wake. The plumbago of Wake is lead, not lead like PB. Uh, it's lead like graphite. And the governor of our state got a really funny idea about sending to Washington, D.C., to the president of the United States at the time about the plumbago. They rolled up all of the, um, uh, the pencil pieces and uh, put burlap around it and then covered it with tar. And uh, those were a roll of those were given to the president of the United States for that. There was another person that was in the room when the president got that uh, roll of, uh, of pencils from North Carolina. And it was a senator that represented the state of New York. Do you know what county was from? Ticonderoga. <laughs> They're still making pencils today because they have the same kind of rock that we have in North Carolina. The iron formations were something that was very interesting and strange because the whole thing was is that until you could get coal with that iron, you never could make anything with it. The Triassic basins you see are the sandstone and coal units, the ones that are in green. And then there's the Great Slate Formation. Now, when we talk about the de uh, development of North Carolina, remember that when the major continents are all out there and we're sticking back at several billion years ago, about a billion years ago, and we're looking at, uh, our, uh, you know, the, the supercontinent of Rodinia, um, North Carolina doesn't even exist yet. It's in between Laurentia and the African pieces that will become the Africa sometime in the future. The cool part about the whole story is that as the continents begin to break, as Rodinia breaks up, there's a series of little platelets that go across the Iapetus Ocean 
to launch into and land into Laurentia. And so what you end up seeing is as the uh, units that make up North Carolina begin to be agglommed onto the continent, you see the Piedmont terrain being connected to Laurentia. And that's what creates the Piedmont that's also in North Carolina as well as in South Carolina. You see also that there's also other terrains that are coming off of Gonwanda land or Gonwanda and is coming in and will actually link up a little bit later and cause the, you know, cause a major um, event to occur tectonically in the area, a mountain building event. So then you end up seeing where the mountains, the Piedmont, and the slate belt are all brought in together in the same thing. The slate belt was really just simply a uh, ocean side unit that was very much sand and other material. But because of the hot water, because of the subduction there on that side of North Carolina, you ended up having a really cool thing happen of where you begin to see the mobilization of minerals around in that formation. And that's where you have the dotted out area, which is the major gold production area in North Carolina. Um, that area is in, at the great slate belt there. So you talk about it being where the rock is turned into slate, but also as the uh, subduction occurs and such, you end up having a great opportunity for minerals being moved around. And that means that gold is, dis is, is dissolved for a depth and then brought up to the surface and in place in uh, quartz veins and other things like that. The coolest part of that whole story is that when the continents really do begin to get back together and Pangaea gets formed again, everything gets squished up again. And that's when you really start the fun part of North Carolina. And that's where really we start with where uh, Professor Olmsted had really seen a lot of what was going on in North Carolina all the way back in time when he was in 1825. Um, later on, when Eliza Mitchell becomes the, the uh, principal scientist for the Geological Survey, um, you end up having where Olmsted decides to go back to Yale or go to Yale where he got his undergraduate and become a professor there. So uh, it's, a, it's a real good story of having faculty that were very much interested in helping the students and stuff like that uh, learn as much as they could about the geology of North Carolina. Now, the big story about this is gold. First discovered in North Carolina in 1799, 12-year-old Conrad Reed finds the gold. It's a 17-pound gold nugget in Cabarrus County, that's near Charlotte. John Reed, his father, basically, you know, wanted to take it and showed it to a jeweler in Fayetteville about three years later. The jeweler said, it's gold. How much you want for it, Mr. Reed? And Mr. Reed said, $3.50. And the jeweler paid him on the spot $3.50, and that was fine. Now, the actual weight of a 17-pound gold nugget would be worth about $3,600 in the currency of the day. So somebody got cheated pretty bad. As it turned out, later on, reports re uh, recall the fact that Mr. Reed actually did sue the jeweler and did receive more money. Now. That's part of the story, but one of the other things about it is, is that in 1825, uh, Matthias Berenger, he's panning for gold in a stream, and he's going upstream as he pans, and he keeps moving upward and then gets to a point in the stream where there's no longer any gold. There was gold downstream, but now there's no more upstream. Well, he decided to go to a, a side of a bank, a stream bank, and sit there and beat on the stream bank for a while and discovered a quartz vein full of gold. And that's where the whole beginning of underground gold mining started in North Carolina. Okay. 
Now, until 1828, North Carolina was the only state that was supplying to the U.S. Mint in Philadelphia with gold. But in 1827, Benjamin Hale, that's of the Hale Gold Mine, found gold in Lancaster County, South Carolina. And he began sending the gold to Pennsylvania or Philadelphia uh, Mint in 1829. The Hale Gold Mine produced over $6 million worth of gold and was one of the richest mines in all of the Eastern United States. Because the trip to the Carolina, from the Carolinas to Philadelphia was dangerous, the Carolinians, that being North and South, needed to have a mint of their own. A private mint was opened in 1820, 1832, and in 1837, the US government opened the mint that's actually located in Charlotte. Now, the private mint was the Bocatcher uh, dollars, and it was, they probably did at least $4 million worth of gold minted, uh, about $4 million worth of gold. And the Charlotte Mint was closed at the beginning of the, of the Civil War, and they had probably coined it about $5 million in gold. There is a place called Gold Hill where several mines are clustered along a fault zone, and it's called the Gold Hill Fault. That deposit exists because hot water was circulating in the fault zone, remobilizing existing gold and getting it concentrated in quartz filled fractures. That's still a place people go out and, and speculate on and actually go dig out on occasionally. And they'll usually get some, some gold. I mean, I got a friend of mine that got back about, you know, half a tablespoon of gold from that from a, from a long weekend. In 1969, that's 170 years after Conrad Reed made his famous find. Construction workers were digging out the foundation for the first Union National Bank in Charlotte, North Carolina and found a gold nugget. That site had been the spoil piles from the St. Catherine mine and the Rudisil mine. Those are two big, big time gold mines in Charlotte. They are now located underneath the John Belk Highway. That's I-277 next to Panther Stadium. So if you ever think that Panther Stadium is not a hot place for, for fun and stuff like that, it's also a hot place for gold because gold's right underneath their feet. Now, one of the things that comes up is I have got, gone out to Charlotte probably more times than I'd like to look at collapse features that occur from gold gold mines. They'll stope up too high to the surface and it just crashes down and you'll have a hole in someone's basement. We went down there at one time and a, uh, a couple had a house that they had just bought that they hadn't lived in very long. And uh, one, of the, one of the columns that supported the um, upper floor of the house, and they had a finished basement with uh, concrete on the floor, and a hole had opened up about three and a half feet wide out there, and the support column had gone all the way down to about 35 feet below the, the uh, height or the, the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the floor, and uh, it turned out to be that they basically couldn't stay in the house because the folks at, uh, in Charlotte just said, hey, this is not a safe place. You've, you've got to put something down there. And you needed to have a piece of steel that probably was five feet by five feet in order to cover up the hole and then be able to put a support column on top of it. And they ended up having to move out of that house. And it was condemned. I've seen that happen more than one time in North Carolina. I've seen it happen more than one time in the Charlotte area. And one of the things we're trying to do with the North Carolina Geological Survey is to put in a, uh, or help the General Assembly to put in a process where we can start to look at rehabilitating sites where gold mines have been or old coal mines have been, where we can actually find ways to get engineers in to be able to make it where it's a safe location again. Uh, we usually get one or two holes a year somewhere in the gold country area where things have collapsed. I mean, one woman, uh, this is three years ago, had a hole and it was right in front of her house and it was 35 feet across and it was 19 feet deep. And the company that was across the road, that was the uh, um, 
uh, aggregates company that was across the road said, we'll be glad to supply the uh, uh, stone for it to fill it all up. But it was like after the second or third load, the company understood that they were going to probably have to put 150, 160 loads of uh, material in to fill that thing totally up. Now I'm talking about some of the commodities and they're going from the gold to the coal to other ones along the way. And we're really gonna to try to, in this uh, presentation, to talk about the mineral resources and stuff in North Carolina. Coal was mined in the Triassic Basin. That's the, the deep river basin, the, the, the green colored areas in that first uh, 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 picture you saw. Uh, they were in a, uh, a place where the Revolutionary War settlements, you know, they all stockpiled coal at their houses because they needed a high temperature fuel to melt lead shot. So when the, uh, uh, the uh, British were coming, they would be able to be able to get and continue to fire at the, at the British uh, when they were coming to take the homes or burn the homes or something like that. Uh, there's a number of of historical houses that they always do a, a recreation of that attack um, every year at, uh, at the time when they had, had that actually happened before back in history. Um, the real cool thing about it is in the coal measures that are in Lee County in the central part of North Carolina, the, there were intrusions of diabase. Diabase is an igneous rock that uh, basically cooked the coal to where it got all the way to anthracite grade. Um, the existing basins had a lot of coal in them and uh, this coal was able to be used uh, uh, a lot in uh, a couple of things that were done after and during the Civil War. There were two major disasters at the Egypt coal mine. In 1895, there was an explosion that killed 50, 43 miners. Uh, this was a really sad situation because in the time in 1895, you would have thought there would have been people that would have the canaries in the coal mines and would be able to see when the, the a bird got distressed that there would be an uh, issue with there's not enough oxygen in here uh, to be able to uh, prevent something from exploding. Or there's, a not, there's too much oxygen in the ground. So... Production restarted five years later in 1900, but the blast cost another 21 lives uh, in 1900 uh, from that, uh, from another explosion. Now, the Carolina Coal Company also owned the Coal Glen Mine, and it's about, you know, uh, two miles north of the Cumnock mine. Another explosion killed 53 miners in May 27th of 1925. I actually met the son of one of those miners and uh, the uh, miner, he was an elderly man, but the whole thing was is that he took off his shirt and his whole entire back was just one giant black spot where he had gotten when the explosion occurred and he was able to get out um, it was one of those things where you had a permanent uh, coal dust, um, I guess it would be the right way to say it, uh, tattoo on your back. Now, one of the coolest things North Carolina has had lots of in the coastal plain has been the opportunity to do phosphate. Nutria who's formerly known as PCS Fawcett, who's formerly known as Texas Gulf Sulphur, began doing phosphate uh, exploration in Eastern North Carolina in 1958. They acquired land in 61, and in 1965, they started mining. In the 56 years since that time, there have been many improvements in the mining technique, and in 1985, the facility really got the one thing that they most looked at and they wanted to have, and that was basically a blending of 
milled clay and gypsum because it was able to recycle the site. They were able to reclaim the sites. It was able for trees to grow again on the site. It was able to get grasses to grow on the site. And a lot of this was because this gyp stack stuff was able to blend and act as a reclamation base so they could then rapidly get the uh, phosphate out and then be able to quickly put the blend of milled clay and gypsum to be able to have the grasses and trees and things like that grow back in the site. So when you look at there and see when you've got a permitted mining area of 12,000 acres and a total of about 104,000 acres have been reclaimed. And these are from, 19, these are from 2005, the last numbers we have. So you're looking at then seeing where it's not like you have a huge area that's a giant soar uh, on the earth. You actually have where they're reclaiming it basically as fast as they can get it, uh, the, the, uh, the phosphate out. Uh, one of the key things about this is the, the whether it's nutria or PCS phosphate or Texas Gulf sulfur, all of these are an important and essential uh, nutrient for getting soil and getting uh, um, agriculture to be able to grow and to be able to thrive. Now, in North Carolina, when you talk about the brickyard and stuff like that, and people think about NASCAR and such, um, a lot of times when you say brickyard, it really means that that's actually where the, a lot of the early NASCAR races were, uh, were run at. Uh, you take sand and you take clay and you blend it together and you make bricks. In North Carolina, there are several brick manufacturing companies and almost all of them use now a continuous line method of you blend the sand, you blend the clay, you blend the water, you get it in a homogeneous mix, and then the mix is extruded like a big giant ribbon, and then it's cut to length and allowed to dry. Then it's then uh, on the outside surface, the brick can be sprayed with something, a coating and stuff like that to give additional uh, interest to the bricks. But the key thing about it is the bricks are put on pallets and moved through a continuous kiln. This is a kiln that goes like almost 60 yards and it is hot. I mean, really hot. I mean, really, really hot. And it stays hot all the time. And it just simply rolls through. And as the bricks go through it, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer to the middle. And then it gets cooler and cooler and cooler, not cold, but cooler and cooler and cooler as it gets to the other end. There are dozens of brick plants in North Carolina, and a lot of our state is brick because it's a resource we have inside the state. We don't use as much stone as we use brick in our state. Now, one of our last resources we have is granite. Uh, the Mount Airy Quarry in Surrey County is white granite. It's been mined for 120 years. This is the Mount Airy of Andy Griffith and Mayberry. It really is a real town and it really is a real place. And, you know, when you look at there and see it on the surface alone, this thing encompasses 60 acres. We're talking about it being like 66 football fields worth of space. It's like 3,500 feet wide and about 1,000 feet, uh, I'm sorry, feet, feet long and then 1,000 feet uh, wide. Um, they always are sitting there. The mother mass is the block of rock nobody ever sees. It's about seven miles long, about one mile wide, and about 8,000 feet deep. So they think they've got enough rock there to last for the next 500 years. It's a beautiful white stone. It's a beautiful, beautiful white stone. Uh, it's a white granite and uh, they use things like water jets at 4,000 pounds per square inch to cut a two and a half inch wide hole and then go up as far as 21 feet down into the rock. And what they're trying to do is basically establish a series of blocks where they're about 10 feet long, 
five feet wide and about five feet deep. And that's what is the resource out there at the, at, at the Mount Airy Quarry. Um, one of the funnest parts about is looking at there and seeing is, is that they use diamond wire to cut a perpendicular slot so then you can release the block. And what you can see in aerial photographs or you can see in satellite images is all those blocks are all lined up, ready to go. And they're ready to go anytime they need to go for things. And uh, they use it a lot in, the, uh, uh, in these sorts of things. Now, I went through this kind of fast, but I want to get a chance to talk with y'all about some of the things that are there and some of the things that we've had here in North Carolina. Uh, one of our biggest issues we have here in our state is that as the state geologist, um, I applied for the job relatively early. Um, I was in sixth grade when I wrote a letter to Steve Conrad, who was the state geologist at the time, and I wrote to him and said, uh, uh, what do I got to do to become the state geologist? And uh, he came back with uh, looking forward to working with you. Uh, many, many years later, um, when I was applying for the job of the assistant section chief in geological survey, uh, the uh, boss at that time was Charles Gardner. Charles Gardner looked over and there was an older man that was next to him. And, and I knew who he was immediately as I, when I walked in the door, it was Steve Conrad. And so uh, he looked at Mr. Conrad and said, Mr. Conrad, do you have any questions you want to ask? And, uh, and uh, Charles, or Mr. Conrad looked up and said, Ken, um, what are the five things you got to do to become the state geologist? And I rattled off my five things that I have to do to become the state geologist. And uh, Steve Conrad pulled the letter out of his pocket that he had that I had sent to him about um, I wanting to be the state geologist someday. And uh, I pulled the letter that I had gotten from Steve that I still had that said, looking forward to working with you. And Charles said, you got the job, Taylor. And uh, we talked about that many times. I got a chance to do a lot of things with Steve and with Charles before the two passed away. And I very much enjoyed the lectures, the effort, and the energy that they both expressed. Uh, Steve was a state geologist for 26 years. He got his bachelor's degree at uh, NC State University. Uh, his boss or his professor was uh, Jasper Stuckey. Jasper Stuckey had been the state geologist for 25 years. And uh, uh, there was basically between the two of them a kindred spirit of the importance of geology is to explain it to people. You do not want to make them feel stupid. You want them to feel that they're very smart because you're telling them why is geology matters? Why does it matter that the planets go the way they do or the geology goes the way it does? Because when you can explain those things to people, they understand the earth is a very, very cool thing to work on. So with that one there, uh, I know I'm probably going way too fast with everybody else, but I want to spend some time getting a chance to talk with everybody about the things we have. So it's question time. I'll start off with one of the questions on this. Um, uh, my background is geology and geophysics. I've always wanted to be a geologist. I always wanted one because I had a rock hammer in my hand when I was five years old. I got an S wing when I was in ninth grade. Uh, that rock hammer is now 59 years old. Um, and I still like carrying it around. It is like an extension of my own self. And I thoroughly enjoy the whole prof profession of geology. Um, I love solving problems. I were looking at samples today with the person that brought in a jar full of samples. Most of it was quartzite and stuff like that, but it was a matter of that I wanted to spend some time with this uh, uh, woman and let her understand this is what I understand and this is what these are and, and identify them for. Her. So in order to get us guarded with this conversation, which I really was hoping is gonna be more of not just me talking, but everybody talking was it's question time. So Ken, Steve Erickson here, how are you doing? And that was a very good talk. A lot of ground to cover in, in that. Um, when, 
goal. So goal was mine very early on. Uh, when did it kind of fade out, or how how long did it did it last? It spaded out in the early 1900s, and the reason it all spaded out because the whole thing was is that you had the mercury scare. Everybody had been using mercury to capture the gold and then burn the mercury off in a pan, usually like a steel pan or, uh, or you know, like, like you know, uh, like, like, a, like yeah, your cl classic um, uh, th thing. And it was a real problem with it because everybody knew that that's mercury is really bad. But then they started using arsenic and it was like even worse. And that's where it really began, where some of the things, it was a matter of, do you really want to get every single fleck of gold or you just want to get the, all the good stuff? And that's about it. Our, our biggest issue we faced in North Carolina was as the gold program began to get tougher and tougher, it became more and more that the, the miners wanted to do something else. Uh, you've got a lot of recreational miners. You can still go out to parts of North Carolina and you can get a whole little jar full of a little, you know, like a, like a baby jar full of, of stuff in maybe a month, maybe something like that. But you have people that come out there and park in our uh, national forest and stuff like that. And they'll spend the whole summer uh, panning for 2000 or $3,000 worth of gold. Where exactly is that located? Uh, that's in the central part of North Carolina, uh, near the Uwari forests. And most of the time, everybody has to understand that right now, the best way to find some of this gold is when someone gets a snorkel line and a pump and basically starts spending most times underwater all the time, just feeling for the rock and stuff like that and sucking it up kind of stuff. This is Dave yeah. Wilhelm. I got a follow-up question to what you were saying. Um, all that mercury and arsenic sounds like uh, you, it might have led to some Superfund sites. Am I right or not? Um, the only one we've really had that became a Superfund site was in the extreme western part of the state, and that was one that's a it's a it is a it is a important one there. Our uh, mining specialist he decided to okay. I really think this is important. So he went and took a sample back uh, at the office kind of thing. And, and uh, he gave it to me. He's the mining, our mining specialist, he's an engineer, mining engineer. And when I handed, he handed it to me, it was like, first of all, one, it's twice as heavy as it should be. And I went and took it and weighed it um, and then took it and got a bucket and put a bucket and worked very hard to get a, a really good idea of what the, actual volume of the rock was. And, uh, you know, when I came back to him, I said, I think it's about three and a half pounds of gold inside this big crystal of pyrite. And he was like, eh. well, the boss, our, our division director said, you can't keep it because it's, you know, we need to take it back to the Superfund site and, uh, and put it back where it belongs. But it's like that, that's where you have, I mean, someone can just walk onto that site and find something that's worth you know, real money in there. Uh, a long time ago, when I first started in rock hounding in North Carolina, you could get at the Glennon Prophylite mine and stuff like that. They had lots of uh, nice cube, cubes, two inches or four inches um, on a side that everybody would collect and they would have their pyrite. And the whole thing was is that I, could, I always knew because when I was as a uh, early student, um, you know, I know that what the density of pyrite was and I knew what the density of gold was. And it was like, this is too heavy for it being just iron sulfide. Well, after I saw a colleague that actually started using acids to digest the, the, uh, uh, the pyrite cubes, you could actually start to see these little veins of, of gold inside of the pyrite crystal. And that became sort of like a cool little thing to look at and stuff like that. But, um, you know, for me, the, uh, the fun part has always been, it's not the mineral, it's about how much knowledge you gain from it. Hey, this is Randy, I have a question. Um, I, I happen to have a pencil sitting on my desk here and I took a look at it and it's a Dixon Ticonderoga number two. Um, I would have had no idea that came from North Carolina. But um, I'm interested in graphite um, in terms of like source material and the sorts of temperature and pressure 
um, situations it forms in and what sort of rock associations you find it with in North Carolina? Well, most times with the graphite, it's the key thing about it being where it has to have been an, uh, probably an organic source. And with the collision, it basically gets cooked in, an, in, a, in a way where the carbon does not get burned up. So it's, it's a very, very complex system of trying to just, just it's sort of like in, it only works in very, 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 very special sites. So, so why does graphite farm instead of coal? It, I, I, I don't know that one really well. Uh, I know that, for example, the one thing that will happen when they were working on the Manhattan Project, because I, I got that peripherally in my uh, in my years at Teledyne Geotech uh, was that, you know, it, it, the they had to go certain places to find it and that making it was not really viable. It was like you had to find it and you had to keep up with it. And you, that was the one of the things where uh, for a lot of these uh, uh, these special elements and stuff like that, it became a real um, it, it became a real interesting way of seeing that without certain specific kinds of metals and certain specific kinds of regulating and absorbing systems to be able to absorb those that radiation, it just didn't work. And that was some of the things that I think you look, read about in the Manhattan Project and stuff like that are that there were so many things that they had to invent on their own. We got plenty of time for more questions. I have a few questions. Um, this is Dave again. Um, how important is coal to North Carolina's economy currently? We haven't mined coal in at least five years now. Uh, we had a demonstration project that was done by one of the miners, and he was really just trying to prove the fact that you could actually extract anthracite coal from less than 15 feet below the surface and uh, they got as much as they were allowed to get. But uh, at the time when they got the permit, it was one of the things where that is a permit we don't run in North Carolina. That's a permit that gets run by the, uh, the folks with the, uh, in the federal level. So he was able to mine it. Yes, he did fill up lots and lots of bags of anthracite coal. And yes, it was a viable making money operation, but it was one of the things where he was not going to be able to remove, you know, thousands of tons of the uh, outcrop. It was only gonna be a demonstration project. Yes, you could get anthracite coal that was sellable grade that would be able to be used. But you know the, the whole thing is, is that looking at there and seeing that for our power plants, many of our power plants in North Carolina still run on coal and that stuff comes in from Pennsylvania and other places. It doesn't come from North Carolina. Okay. and. From what you said earlier, it sounds like to get from bituminous to anthracite is a matter of heating it under, you know, by, by um, geologically heating it. And yeah, the, the 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 what you have in the Triassic Basin in the uh, central part of North Carolina, the uh, rock has been heated because there has been an intrusion of a diabase dike. And the diabase dike has actually sometimes been so close to the coal that the coal has been turned into coke. And it's no longer a burnable item. It's now basically just what coke is. It's a, it's a, it, it is something that's added in metallurgy stuff like that. Just uh, uh, remind me what coke is exactly. Uh, coke is basically you've burned all of the burnable all of the carbon in it has been turned into something else okay uh ken we have a question from uh, an attendee who says can you tell us about the finding of the minerals such as emeralds in a city and they give an example of the hidden tight emerald hollow mine okay there's lots of people that love to do rock hounding on the in western north carolina 
and they look for hiddenite or emeralds and stuff like that. Um, the fun part about it is that the guy who owns the mine, uh, a guy named Hill, uh, Jesse likes to first check and see if he can get all of the emeralds out first or the hiddenite out first before anybody else comes in. And uh, there's been a lot of stuff where people will be in there and they'll find a bug and they start excavating the mug. And that's when uh, Hill will get up there and say, sorry, 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 we got to close, we got to close, got to close, we got to get some, we have to close. And then, then he closes it and then he get, basically works out that little uh, bug and takes out all the minerals that someone else was already getting, trying to get out there anyway. Uh, that's caused him some grief, but it's one of those situations where it's a pay for mine. You know, you pay a price to go in the mine and then you pay a price on what you get out. Okay, we've, uh, we've got another question from Hugh. Could you comment on North Carolina diamonds? Are they still found? Yes, they're still found. We found 13 of them for sure. Uh, they are very nice little diamonds. I think the probable location for one of them is actually underneath the interstate highway uh, just south of Asheville. Uh, there's way too many things. The rock looks like it is a kimberlite. It, it looks like a, ro a kimberlite rock, and but I don't see any diamonds in it. But it's like it's uh, it probably is. But you're talking about the diamonds being on the order of maybe two to three millimeters in size. It's a diamond, okay. no questions asked, it's a diamond, but it's so small. Okay, and then let's see, we have two questions from Diane Lynch. Uh, the first one is the Mount Airy white granite, has it been used in any famous monuments or markers? And then the second question is, the houses with the mine sinkholes, how old were the houses when they were built? Um, the Mount Airy granite is probably the most popular of all because it's so uniform and therefore it's a lot of places. I know that the, uh, the crosses at like, for example, Arlington National Cemetery, I thought those were uh, uh, not granite, but they were uh, uh, limestone or something like that, but I, it, it, I don't know about that because the whole thing is that's what you see is the all the white crosses and Star of David's in uh, um, at, at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, but you know, I, I, I look at there and see that that's uh, something I need to need to check there. But uh, for a lot of people, the the key thing we're looking at here is that mineral resources. A lot of stuff we have right now. Um, and, and this is an issue that a lot of people have to understand is that I'm looking at sometimes a rock or a mineral where it's been sitting on the shelf for 60, 90, 150 years. They've known about that rock, but now they only now understand what it's actually usable by. I mean, right now we have lithium being mined or getting ready to be mined in North Carolina. It was mined before, but it wasn't successful because it wasn't for making batteries, it was for making lithium grease, basically a lubricant and uh, uh, a dry grease. Uh, but you know the, the right now, the uh, uh, agreement right now with between Elon Musk and the, uh, uh, the Piedmont Lithium uh, uh, company is basically 100% of what they're going to mine out of that mine is going to be shipped off to uh, Elon Musk to turn into batteries. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have one from Mary Helen Inskeep. Where uh, in the map that you had at the very beginning, in, in which mineral assemblage do the Blue Ridge Mountains exist? The Blue Ridge Mountains are really there at the extreme western end of the, of the state. And the minerals that are in there are mostly kyanite. Um, you can find kyanite all the way up on the top of Mount Mitchell if you walk, know where to walk on uh, the trail or which trail to walk on to get there. And uh, a lot of times when people get up to the top, the, the uh, uh, rangers are usually saying, you got to put that back down there. You're not allowed to pick up rocks on a state park. And uh, 
the 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 key thing uh, a lot of times for many of our state uh, sites and stuff like that they work really hard to make sure that we don't have it all wander away uh, uh, stuff like that uh, there are a lot of places in North Carolina where we have very interesting and very unique minerals and and other minerals and fossils and stuff like that and we really would like people to look at them enjoy them see them take pictures with them and stuff like that but not to carry them away okay um and let's see one from uh mary Kay arthur uh and, and i'm i'm going to read this i'm not quite sure it's what happens that anthracite get made instead of the less useful kinds of coal? The, the, the key thing about it is, is that the coal we have in the coal measures there depends upon how far away from the diabase dikes, depends upon what its, uh, its grade is. It will go from, uh, most all of it is the lowest grade, uh, bituminous, and moves on up to anthracite and then up, all the way up to coke. And uh, for that, uh, a lot of times that you find that right now, um, we have, for example, in our two oil wells that we have in North Carolina that are shut in right now, both of them have helium in them. And uh, so we're talking about it being two tenths of 1% of helium in the natural gas. Well, if you took a capstan jet turbine and that's a machine that basically cooks everything together at one time. And uh, you would end up having where the, uh, methane, uh, in, uh, the methane and other things like that would be burned, but the helium would be left alone because it's not, it's not burnable there. So you'd end up having where what would be coming out of the stack would be CO2 and uh, water vapor. Um, all of the uh, all the methane and pentane and stuff like that would have been burned up to run the uh, jet jet turbine, uh, and then the whole idea is the other thing that would be coming out there would be helium, and one of the ideas is that taking that as a process, the CO two and uh, and the water vapor becomes dry ice in a chilling unit, and then the helium is then chilled down to where it's now not a gas, but a liquid. And then you're looking at being able to provide to the hospitals in uh, the area around there where you'd be able to then deliver almost at no cost um, uh, for um, the chemicals that are the, the, uh, the, the liquid um, that's needed the, that, to be able to run the MRI machines and the CT scanners. And so there's a number of people that have been looking at that from the Oil and Gas Commission uh, for, you know, is there, is there a break-even point to where we could actually be producing from those two wells or five other wells like that same, same size uh, that would be able to produce enough uh, liquid helium uh, for uh, every hospital to get whatever it needs for that kind of thing for any of the MRI and CT scanning machines. Okay, uh, here's one from Barbara Heidemann. She says, talk a bit about the corundum slash garnet area around Franklin, North Carolina. Um, it, it's a fun place to go. Um, I have discovered that the further I go in my career and the older I get, the less likely I'm going to find anything. I used to be able to find it all the time when I was little, and then it just kind of like stopped after I got my undergraduate degree in 79. And it's like, uh, you know, I, I usually will find something, but not, it won't be the best of the, of the day kind of thing. But it's like for those, you know, the, the one thing people like to see with those is that there are many of the gym shops and stuff like that that have lots of samples to see, but you can also go out to there and I did it one time with the wife and the daughters and, you know, the little one, all she wanted to do was wipe her hands off on my pants. So I got caked with mud and stuff like that on that day. But it was one of the things where she kind of enjoyed herself, but we didn't find anything, but we had a nice time playing in the mud. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's another one from Hugh. 
Could you comment on North Carolina diamonds? Are they still found in any relation to the graphite? The, the diamonds are basically in the extreme western part of the state, that being toward Asheville, north of Asheville and stuff like that. We think that there's actually a kimberlite pipe there. And that's what we that was, I talked about earlier. And that may be why the diamonds are so small because it's just simply a small pipe and there's just a couple of them in there. But you're talking about it being where it's on the DOT right away. It's really, really close to the edge of the, dry, of the actual pavement kind of thing there. And we, we really want to discourage the rock hounds to get out there and start banging on that stuff because it's, it's really dangerous right there next to the highway. Okay, here's one from Deb Priest. I'm sorry I asked my question in the chat instead of on the Q&A, but are there any interesting geological field trips someone could take in North Carolina? Yes, the book that I shared with everybody at the beginning, the Geology of the Carolinas one, exploring that, they have a several field trips that are part of that. There's actually a whole the third of the book is just field trips. Great. I'm going to interject here real quick because um, I think uh, Mary Kay had a related question. Is there a roadside geology of either of the Carolinas? Sounds like this book essentially serves that purpose. Would you agree, Kenneth? That is that. That is that. Yes, it is. Okay, let's see. Um, There's one from Leo. What are the minerals? minerals, comma, gems, comma, et cetera, that make Franklin, North Carolina so popular and well-known. How were they formed? The coolest thing about when you go to Franklin is they have a museum there, which costs nothing to get into. And a lot of people get hooked on, oh, that's great, that's great, that's great, that's great, that's cool, that's cool, I want to find that, I want to find that, I want to find that. You've got ruby crystals and stuff like that in there where they're like three or four inches in diameter. Um, that it took decades of time to collect that stuff up there. It's not like it comes out every day, but it's a matter of that people see it and then they want to go out there and play with it and they want to get it. And you may walk away like I did when I got a ruby crystal that's about a half an inch by a half an inch and that's all it was. But I was happy to have it. <laughs> um, and another one from you. Does the state have many glacial findings or is it too far south? Uh, this, this, Hugh brought up an interesting little story. Um, a long time ago, back when I was an undergraduate at Carolina, there was a professor that really thought that he had found glacial indicators in North Carolina. And uh, the uh, professor uh, went to a meeting. It was in 1977. Uh, Geological Society of America Eastern Section meeting, and he came up with and presented his findings. The only problem was is that a number of people had believed that with those grooves he had found on rock, what he had made plaster casts of and stuff like that, um, the real reason the rocks were done like that was not because of it being glacial thing, it was because of the chains that were used by the loggers to drag the trees back and forth from where they're cut and then dragged along the ground and such. And that was what created the, the steel cable was what actually was carving out those, uh, those, those things there. Well, it turned out to be that one of the uh, people that was a very much a skeptic of this whole process um, had gotten an actual uh, sample from a outcrop and it actually had a piece of, of uh, a wire, uh, you know, uh, metal wire in it that was caught in it there. And he had brought that to the same uh, Geological Society of America meeting. And so he spoke after that professor and then showed them this like, here is what we found. And this is what we found was inside of this grooved rock was a piece of steel cable. And that steel cable was from a logging operation. And that was where it kind of like all fell apart right there. And uh, 
that professor did not do any more meetings uh, for the next probably 10 years or something like that. And it was like, we're all scientists out here. You come with your ideas. I come with my ideas. We go into the crucible of a meeting and we talk through our ideas. And if you get new science that says that you're not in the in the correct area, you say, I have readjusted my uh, hypothesis and I am pursuing a different activity. But I look at there and see, is, is that it's, we're not here in a geological meeting to embarrass colleagues because they may have not known all of the facts when they were cited to present their information. Important lesson there. Mm -hmm. um, another one from Mary Helen. Phosphate fertilizers have caused problems here in Minnesota and are now restricted. Have you had any problems like that in North Carolina, given the amounts mined there? Um, the over fertilization of stuff has always been, everybody wants to have a greener grass than anybody else around the neighborhood kind of stuff there. But I look at there and see is that a lot of people are getting much more aware of, uh, you know, let's not use everything all the time or let's put twice as much on it as we need to kind of stuff. Uh, I, I look at there and see that many times the, the, you know, we have Gen X and stuff like that in North Carolina and, we have to deal with the fact that there are places where uh, these forever chemicals are not gonna go away anytime soon. And if you live near one of these places that are using these chemicals or have used these chemicals, you understand why their people may be sick in that area. Okay, and, and Mary Helen makes another comment a little later uh, that phosphates uh, are also banned here in Minnesota in laundry detergents. Um, and it looks like maybe the last question, and I'm not quite sure, uh, it's from Nancy, and she says, have they found these same minerals in South Carolina? Uh, a lot of the same minerals are found in the other, uh, in the sister state. Uh, you know, the, 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 they are two states that were actually joined together at the beginning and never really have been separated from each other. Uh, you know, the, the, the geology goes across state lines and such, but you look at there and see is that for some of the areas, I mean, I went out to the Brewer gold mine back when I was a gra uh, undergraduate and, you know, fine, you could find all kind of stuff out there. You could find crushers, you could find things out that they just left out in the woods because it weighs too much to be carried away. And uh, you end up having a lot of times where people look and see that, you know, just because we can make this product do we really want to make this product when we consider what impact that might be on the environment okay uh and i i'm getting one off of the chat list here and i think maybe we've already covered this is there a roadside geology of either of the carolinas yes that that's the the roadside geology of the carolinas is the good book that the one i showed at the beginning there yep. and that's probably the best one could, could you, uh, at the end of this, could you email us the title and the author, and then I can send that to everybody? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. That's actually the first slide on, or that's the second slide on the on the entire talk. Right. But if but if people don't want to uh, listen to the recording, then they No could... problem at all. No problem yeah. at all. And I have a couple of questions, because I didn't, we didn't find out how to enter them in the, the Q&A. So uh, back to the bricks. Um, just curious. How long does it take to make a brick from farming it to uh, drying it to kill, putting it in the kiln and cooling it down? How long does that take? I think it's four and a half or five days. Okay. Because they blend it specifically. That means when they're, when you're in the hoppers where they're, where they're actually making the brick, it is a very, very specific, they are putting in this much of this, this much of that, and that much of that into the, into the blender. And that's what then sits there for five or six hours, grinding it all up into dust. And then from there on farming it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yep. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, a question uh, with, about the white granite. You mentioned about the mother mass extending down from the surface to 8,000 feet. So this is one one giant block that is essentially 8,000 feet thick. Is that what I'm uh, understanding? That's correct. It basically is like one, one entire little drop of 
of uh, molten granite that moved or molten uh, uh, magma that moved upward and basically emplaced in, in, in itself in there. Probably it was more than maybe a mile, a mile and a half further. It's been exposed now. So the whole thing is, is that it was probably, uh, it, it, I don't know if the Native Americans they may have seen it, but the whole thing about it was is that it's a very homogeneous rock. It's really hard to make flints out of it because it's all homogeneous. Okay. So that's why I think it'll last 500 years because it's so thick. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's see. I, I see we have another question from Mary Kay. Uh, what are the current environmental issues? geologically based in the Carolinas? The geologically based issues are always going to be the same thing. Um, we have places in our state, for example, that we have radioactive minerals in there. Um, right now, there is a, in the law, uh, that 1945 is when they wrote the law, that said basically Uranium is the only radioactive mineral in North Carolina, and that's not correct. Uh, but you have thorium and others. Well, the law just says the only radioactive mineral is uranium, which is incorrect. And the problem you face is that when you're looking at and seeing, I mean, we have uh, uh, places where there is a good amount of lithium in uh, the uh, groundwater in certain parts of North Carolina, where uh, do the people seem to be happier in those counties than in other counties that don't have lithium in the groundwater? I don't know, but I also look at there and see that we are very much in the, uh, I'm on the oil and I'm staff for the oil and gas commission. And we're very much wanting to know about what things people can be exposed to from sample uh, from oil and gas wells and stuff like that, and seeing if we can minimize that information and minim not minimize the information, but minimize the risk for the workers and the people that live near those uh, those oil oil and gas wells. So, how much oil and gas do you actually produce in North Carolina? Uh, right now, we have two shut-in wells, one's at 960 pounds per square inch, the other one's at 740 pounds per square inch. Uh, they were both drilled in 1998, and uh, they've been around there since then. Uh, we check them every year, uh, and do a flow test for them every year. Uh, the USGS came down, the US Geological Survey came down and took some samples away, and uh, that kind of thing. So it's, it, it was an interesting little project there. The real problem we face is that our oil and gas law in North Carolina is very specific. If you want to put an oil and gas well in, that's wonderful. It's going to cost you $1 million. That's what the environmental damage bond has to be is a million dollars. The only thing about it is what is written in the law is that that amount of money can be raised to any amount by the oil and gas commission by vote which means that nobody wants to drill for oil and gas in North Carolina because they don't know if it's going to cost them $5 million, $7 million, $10 million in order to get that well drilled. No one spends that kind of money anywhere in the United States or in the world for looking for oil and gas. Well, I know that I, I did oil and gas work in, in Oklahoma, and of course they have the infamous problem of... Uh, of uh, orphan wells that were drilled. And I'm, sounds to me like you guys are trying to prevent that from happening. Yeah, the, for me, the key thing about it is, is that I have been a student of the history of the state and have a lot of good information that goes back all the way to 1925 when the very first well was drilled. And for a lot of them, they were drilling just to see if we could get something. I mean, it was like there was no seismic line that were run. There was nothing done to see if there was actually a potential for it. I mean, when they drilled the well at Hatteras, uh, and it was like you could see the lighthouse from where the hole was drilled. Uh, uh, later on, when they actually had to move the lighthouse, uh, 
the uh, they actually went over the top of where the oil well that had been used to look for oil and gas at Hatteras. They just thought they had the biggest pile of sand and just somewhere in there ought to be oil. And that was nothing was there. Nothing was there at all. Well, as long as, as, long as you mentioned Cape Hatteras and talk about your barrier islands. And of course, for some of us who are aviation freaks, we know about Kill Devil Hill and the Wright brothers. And, and uh, can you tell us a bit about the formation of the, the offshore uh, islands and how they're doing and, and problems that they're associated with? Well, you look at there and see us when I showed you the picture at the beginning showing you where the coastal plain was, you know, you look at there and see that there were there's a period of time where there was no east coast. It was all the way to, you know, the, the top of those uh, outcrops that were where coastal plain started. There was places where the water was probably uh, at the at the coast that was probably 300 to 600 feet deep. And uh, during that, that period of time where basically, you know, it's, we're, we're, it's, an all, it's an all warm world back then. It was like all the ice melted on both um, of the uh, poles. And uh, basically this was the highest water stand that the, the, uh, the planet saw. Now, uh, hopefully we're not gonna have that happen again, but if it does happen again, we have to be prepared to be able to deal with the retreat from those areas that are just simply too shallow. Let's see, uh, Ken, we have another one, let's see, from Mary Ann. Uh, does the North Carolina Geological Survey input extend offshore, thinking in particular of oil exploration? Uh, I, as a state geologist of North Carolina, I can tell you my, my, my authority ends at the water's edge. When the water turns salty, it's not my property anymore. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Dave, do you have anything else? I don't have anything else. Uh, okay. Randy? Uh, no, not, not right now. Well, Ken, I want to thank you for a most intriguing presentation. We got a lot of fascinating questions, uh, and I think everybody uh, was very interested in, in what you had to present. So, Thank you very much, and uh, we maybe we'll see you again in the future. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Really do appreciate it. And good night, all. Hope to see you back here in two weeks. <laughs>